Chapter 2. It was either that or Changi Nick. Those fucking lousy slants had me locked up for four days over that poxy bar bill. I'd been arrested, charged and remanded in custody, or the singer equivalent, and now I'd only a precious few days to rectify the situation. It was either that or Changi Nick. Changi Jail houses some of Singapore's most serious criminals, including those serving long stretches and some sentenced to death, usually by hanging and traditionally on a Friday morning. Today was Saturday and that was a relief. I'd had to have been drafted in just to meet the weekly quarter. They'd questioned me relentlessly for the past few days. Where I'd been? Why was I there? How was I going to go about making matters right? Desperately trying to get to the bottom of my intentions in their beloved country. Truth was, I had no real intentions, apart from not to return to the Nick back home. I'd elected not to invoke my right to assistance from the British Embassy, for obvious reasons, and much to their puzzlement. They knew something wasn't right, but they couldn't quite put their finger on it. But it was easier not to try, and hence the reason I'd been given three days' pardon to rectify the situation. I'd explained my problems away under the guise that it wouldn't be good for my reputation back home to be caught up in such events. A wonderful citizen like me would be crucified publicly by the Wakefield Express if word got out, momentarily making the Express sound more elaborate than the Sun or the Daily Mirror. During the interrogation, my brain retained its general good form, computing quicker than lightning as I reeled off the fable of a well-to-do businessman relieved of his essentials in a land far, far away from home. A woeful tale of cancelled credit cards and sleepless nights that could melt even a copper's black heart. The assurity that my wealthy friends back in the UK would help sort the situation out add into the yarn. It would simply take me a day or two to make arrangements for the funds to be transferred over. The hotel would be recompensed in some, and I'd be on my merry way. To add effect, I didn't stop for one minute telling them how pathetic I was, and it appeared to be doing the trick. They were clearly buying it for now. I'd been wearing my usual attire of a three-piece pinstripe suit when they'd pulled me, trying to portray the image of a rugger-playing barrister. I had a couple of different suits for different occasions, but all of them were three-piece and pinstriped. I worked in one, I played in one, I liked suits, and so did my calf. I'd done my best to retain my composure under interview, mildly losing my temper only a couple of times with the pompous officials stood in my path. I'm not playing. Some kind of game it is. I don't know what kind of game, but I'm not playing. I'd barked, before quickly regaining my sanity and reining myself back in for my own good. Even a blind man could see I wasn't telling the truth, but they had to give me the benefit of the doubt, plus it would be far less paperwork and aggravation if I could rectify the situation for them. The language barrier was beginning to frustrate all concerned, and my stereotypical Chinese takeaway owner impersonations were failing miserably to convert to anything meaningful or indeed help matters at all. I'd been given bail of sorts, my pleas reinforced by the fact that I was a close friend of the ex-mayor of Castleford, Mr Burke Corris, who would stand surely for me and vouch for my good character. What did they know? These idiots were under the impression I was next in line to the throne. I'd been lucky. I knew the powers of the police were unlimited and they could do exactly what they wanted. I'd had a stroke of luck out here. Another clean break was ready to ruin. I'd already burnt my bridges whilst on licence back home in the UK and skipped off to Singapore. I say skipped, it was a bit more of a stumble and a trip. What a bloody debacle. You'd think they'd want rid of me, not make it fucking difficult. That's the British police force mentality for you. Waste another few grand of the taxpayers' money when there was clearly a smarter way to iron the problem out. I was almost certain there was a warrant out for my arrest, so I decided to leave the country in as low-key a manner as possible. As low-key as a six-foot-three British heavyweight contender possibly could. I couldn't just wander into Altham's on Kirkgate. Alarm bells would be ringing. Luckily I had a few friends of influence down south who were more than willing to play a small role in getting me out of their air forever, no matter what the cost. 
the main one being my old pal Alex. Originally from Hunslet, but now based down in London, he had a vested interest in a travel agency near his offices in the Haymarket. Without so much as a few quid to my name, or so he thought, I'd managed to blag a paid flight on the back of some fictitious royalties that were coming my way from my publisher, Old Man Lofthouse, back in Pontefract. Anyway, I'd made it, eventually, and here I was. I'd never been to Singapore before, but a few of my more well-travelled friends had told me it was my kind of scene, and they knew me far too well. By sheer perseverance, I'd managed to get a couple of days' release to sort the situation out, convincing those crazy singer pigs that I could raise the funds to clear the hotel bill and get myself back home through that very same pal of mine back in London. If I'd been back home in the UK, I probably could have actually pulled it off and cleared a debt like that. But all the way over here in Singapore, there wasn't a cat in hell's chance anyone had lend me the money. They'd be praying I never got back. I was in no position to dish out intimidation tactics either. I'd rubbed half the population of the British Isles up the wrong way. My credit had expired with at least 99% of my friends and an even higher percentage of my enemies, some of which I'd bled dry just before I'd left. <laughs>